Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohamed Keshavarzi. I'm an MSPhD student at the Department of <coughs> Architecture. Um, I'm going to quickly present my part of my work in pro progress um, thesis called RAD VR, uh, which is uh, done with the adv advisorship of Professor Kallas. So uh, daylighting is one of the most interesting factors that architects uh, like to address. It's uh, highly visible. It's um, very dynamic in terms of time and s location based on the time of the day, um, the day of the year, your location on the earth. It's, uh, it's always on the move. So it's uh, rather hard to master and also uh, very interesting to play with and design around. So. Um, also, it has a lot of impact on health, work performance, and the overall spatial quality of the space. Um, so, um, current conventional um, studies in daylighting come, uh, come with um, running long simulations. Um, what you don't get in these simulations is the quality of space, your spatial experience and um, the understanding of scale. And it's not real time. So it takes from minutes to hours to basically generate one of these frames. So what we thought was, how about using virtual reality to um, simulate these environments uh, for daylighting design and also experience the scale and the spatial uh, quality of the space. Now, as Alan mentioned, virtual reality isn't that easy. It has its own limitations. Um, computation power uh, is one of the main ones. You have these headsets that need at least um, 65 to 75 hertz of refresh rate. That means a lot of rendering has to happen in one second. And that means you have to somehow fake it. Um, also, we have brightness issues. Um, the Vive um, gives you the brightness of around 400 dux, the Oculus around 130, and that's not even close to what you really see in, in the real world. So we thought of merging these two together. That means getting the qualitative factors of virtual reality of game engines and quantitative results from simulation engines, which in our case would be Radiance as a simulation tools, which uh, which is being developed in um, LBNL. I should go for the last one. And um, in this experience, you can basically play with the sun, change the time, change the date, and um, see the effect it has on your building. So this is a sun path diagram. As you see, the user is easily changing the time of the day with its joystick. Uh, you can experience this inside of your building, and you can also make your building transparent so you can see the exact location of the sun. And then with a click of button and setting some setting, I mean, th doing some settings, you can easily get a plane of simulations of <coughs> useful daylight and metrics inside virtual reality. Um, so we're really hopeful to evaluate this tool with both user experience and uh, more concrete simulations. And thank you very much. Uh, my name is Asma Kazmi, and I'm a, a professor in the Department of Art Practice as well as the Berkeley Center for New Media. Uh, what I wanted to do today is to introduce an exhibit that I curated, um, which is up till the 26th of this month. Um, it's an exhibit that's called Deep Dive, or The Limits of Immersion. Um, and it's um, at the Worthrider Art Gallery, which is um, in the Art Practice Department. Um, the exhibit showcases art, uh, um, eight projects. Um, they. Four of those were made um, at UC Berkeley, including my own work, uh, which you see a, an image of um, here, as well as um, four international projects uh, that I brought in. 
What What's exciting to me about the exhibit that is that it um, it creates a, a contrast between um, the industry model of um, AR VR development, which is um, really focused on creating highly immersive and interactive environments. Um, the the works in the art exhibit, uh, like early video art, uh, utilize um, um, you know low cost production methodologies as well as um, um, breakages and fissures, um, abstractions in um, in the representations and imagery uh, that's uh, that's produced. Um, so, uh, but having said that, all of the project um, have a critical approach towards the medium uh, as well as to the content that the uh, projects are, um, are, are um, uh, showcasing. Uh, some, of the, some of the broad themes that are being addressed in the artworks in nonlinear and poetic uh, ways include um, uh, comments on post-colonial thought, um, uh, disability, um, our, um, our relationship to technology and the preservation of history. Um, so I hope, uh, I hope you get to see the exhibit. Um, yeah. Thanks. Hi, my name is Domini and I'm the IVP of Virtual Reality at Berkeley. Um, and I'm Madison, I'm the EVP. Um, internal vice president and external vice president, yes. Sorry. So do you want to talk about the mission? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, we are undergraduate students. So um, VR at Berkeley is an undergraduate student organization, um, and we focus on research, um, outreach, education, all within the AR, VR, MR. Um, community and so here's a list of some of our uh, projects right now um, but w there's also a few that aren't listed here um, so we can talk about decal yeah. afterwards but here. Yeah. so our current projects with the goal with our projects spans vastly we have some projects like Halloween experience which the goal is to introduce people who've never experienced VR before in a new and fun way and then projects from MR and immersive cinema, which seek to experiment with what can be done with these fields, vo both in VR and AR, and kind of push the boundaries and see what we can do. And then there's more research side projects, which work with uh, CRISPR and the Lawrence Lab. And we also have a few educational projects, such as the CRISPR one currently is working on mapping genomes so that people can look at them in AR and understand in AR VR textbooks, which really span from students coming together and being like, what are we missing from our education? and how can we help supplement that with AR and VR. We also currently have a decal, which is aimed at teaching students here more about AR and VR. So currently it is a 20 student class and it runs in Blum Hall. It is, uses riffs and the first half of the class is just teaching them about VR from like Unity and modeling and the second half lets them get into small groups and build their own project. So it's really just giving them the skills they need and then allowing them to like go free and create anything that they think is good and viable for the space. Um, yeah, so every semester we basically, um, we take applications for students to join our teams. Um, there are several teams at a time, so every semester there's a different amount of teams. Um, and then, uh, so we hire for different positions, so everything from you know 3D artists, 2D artists, um, we need a lot of teams like immersive animation and film need um, video editing. So it really spans a really wide range um, of different needs for these teams. Some of them need scripters, some of them need you know, play testers or UI people. Um, so yeah, and we also have outreach. So what outreach does is we go um, either to events like um, hackathons or just places where um, VR demos are needed. Um, so we'll, companies and organizations will reach out to us and have us show up and demo um, at their events. And then we also go to like the Berkeley Public Library every Friday and we set up in there and do kind of like open VR demos for anybody. So uh, for a lot of people there, that's their first experience ever with VR. It's really exciting. Um, also because it's the public library, 
Uh, we get everywhere from high school students to a lot of people like in their 70s and 80s um, who are, you know, the, the comment we get a lot is I'm too old for this. Um, but they're so you know excited once they put the headset on. And it's, it's a really rewarding, um, cool experience to kind of introduce these people to a new medium and see their reactions to it. So we all sorry. We also have uh, different outreaches such as uh, collegiate VR esports, where we try and create a community, maybe not for people who can don't want to build anything, but just want to use the technology. And so those are some of our current initiatives. And we are demoing outside now, and we'll also be demoing again tomorrow at the AR VR Symposium. And on Cal Day. Tickets are free for the AR VR Symposium, and we'll be demoing in Kresge, uh, Jacobs Hall, and on Sprawl. So come check us out. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Davian Gabriel. I'm a history of art undergraduate here at Berkeley, and I am going to be presenting my senior thesis, which involves prototyping and using VR to uh, show, to understand art in a new way. So this painting is called The Gallery of Cornelius Vandergeest. And as you can see, uh, the title, actually I should start, the title of my senior thesis is Imagining an Impossible Room. Um, though it might not look like it, this room is impossible. And um, the way in which we know this is because the artist, William von Haecht, when he painted it, he copied paintings exactly from his patron's gallery, his patron's collection. So these paintings actually exist in real life and we can use those measurements to actually reconstruct this room as I have done in my senior thesis and to understand that he has used, taken a lot of liberties and using a lot of embellishments to actually fit all of this art onto one wall. <laughs> this is the prototype of a reconstruction I have made as you can see, obviously, in the center here, um, that unfortunately halved painting is because the painting was later cut off um, in half, but that is as it would have existed in the room. And I am using VR, hopefully, as I further and continue in this project to best showcase how this room is impossible. I could use diagrams and whatnot, but I, in conceptualizing this process, I felt as though in using VR and actually placing someone within the room that can best showcase how the room is impossible and could not have actually existed. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kat Quigley, and I'm a producer at Lawrence Hall of Science, and unfortunately Wayne wasn't able to make it today. But um, we're going to be, if he was here, talking about our collaboration together, um, me as the advisor and him as the faculty liaison on a capstone project through the Fung Institute um, this semester, this last year. And so our team did two different VR games, and the first one was exploring the human microbiome. So you step into like the small intestine, of a human being and you battle bad bacteria. And so the idea there is like, uh, we were trying to figure out with both of these games how to create STEM learning in a VR context. And um, so this one, they basically learn about excessive use of antibiotics can lead to um, drug resistant bacteria and like other strategies for using more probiotics or calling upon the immune system and things like that. Um, and then in the whale game, um, it's meant to be exploring the ecosystem of our kind of like informal Lawrence Hall of Science mascot, which you may know the fin whale that's on the plaza. So it's like very beloved by the children. They love climbing on it. And we were like, let's have this be in VR so the kids can see how Fina the fin whale, you know, lives her life and swim with it. So the kids actually like uh, the students program the controllers so you can actually swim underwater and kind of like avoid motion sickness because you're kind of pulling the world as you make these motions. And there's a card that you can bring up, like that we're calling the fish card, where you can find out information about the whale and stuff like that. And so, um, let's see, how am I doing on time? So, um, it's, been, it's been a really awesome collaboration so far. And I think the coolest thing, <laughs> so the coolest thing I think is being able to do user testing for both of these experiences at Lawrence Hall of Science. So the students were able to come up 
and set up on weekends to test with our visitors and people just loved it. And it actually worked on children as young as like six and seven years old, which is something that we weren't really sure about. And like even as young as four years old, we just like held it up to their head and they were like, oh, this is awesome. So it's really, it hasn't had any problems with parents being concerned or any dangers or anything like that. Um, Cause it's a very short use period as well, like three to five minutes. Um, and so you can see here some very happy children <laughs> playing the games. And it's also a nice opportunity for our visitors to see how real engineers use coding to do things um, and inspire them to possibly pay more attention to math or get interested in coding to do something neat. So um, the last few seconds, I just would talk about the next step. So in the future, we're hoping to Im improve our onboarding process by collaborating with the VR club at Berkeley to generate kind of based on their decal class, like a class just for the capstone team to um, get the skills that they need to go through the whole pipeline more quickly. And then um, basically, we're, because this was such a success, we're going to start a new space at the hall called Virtual Adventures over the summer. And we're going to basically have um, an ongoing showcase of different VR experiences, um, hopefully drawing from the UC Berkeley community. So I'm hearing so many cool projects, and if anyone's interested in being part of that showcase or having your student work showcased and, or doing user testing with our visitors, I'd love to explore that further. Thanks. Hi, my name's Justin Underhill. I'm a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the History of Art Department here at Berkeley, and I I use laser scanning and photogrammetry to document works of art and architecture that don't exist anymore or have been significantly changed, and I reconstruct how light and sound sculpted people's experience, sacred experiences um, a long time ago in distant places. Um, so here on the left, I'm scanning, laser scanning the Cathedral of Malaga with my laser scanner, and here on the right, before I was here, I was at the USC School of Cinema. It was a split appointment between USC, the School of Cinema, and their art history department, and this is me playing around with my first my first developer kit, the second developer kit that Oculus came in. And I had about a year playing around with that before I felt comfortable teaching it. And when I came to Berkeley, I was lucky that I was able to kind of square my photogrammetry and laser scanning uh, tools with my new VR tools. So this is the class I taught this semester. I've, been I've taught two classes that were explicitly VR oriented. The first one, was this, this the first one I'll show you some showcases now. The one I'm currently teaching we start with the mid-19th century and learn how actually 3D images work and the history of them. They've been around since 1860-ish. Um, and we learn all about the optics, convergence, accommodation, um, and then we move into VR design. So we learn about haptics, uh, the neuroscience of touch, uh, the neuroscience of controllers and vibration. We also learn about 3D audio and interworld uh, distances and how you actually hear stuff and how, how that's constrained in VR. Um, and we also have set up a, uh, places for students to uh, sit in Moffitt and try out VR experiences. So every week they have like four or five different VR experiences that they're accountable to learn. Just as if you were in a film class, you'd have to learn, you have to watch a lot of movies. Um, we're, they're having a lot more fun. They don't have to watch like bad old French films. They get to like <laughs> use cool VR. Um, <laughs> and now as part of that for both of these, they've also learned to develop in Unity. So I've taught all of them uh, how, to, how to code in C Sharp, the basics and how to put together their own projects. And in lieu of like these long, horrible final papers, uh, they get to design their own projects if they want. Uh, we also reach out to lots of industry people and go on field trips. That's a big hit. Um, I wanted to showcase a student project. This is four of my really great students, Isabel Soloaga, Anis Osogeda, uh, Kyung Oh, and Theo Snow. And uh, last semester, I taught a class where each student, it was called Designing Interactive Museum Exhibits, and each student got a different uh, object from a museum and had to design something about it. First, as a computer screen that would go next to the object, ostensibly, and then they got the option of porting it to VR. This is a Pomo house. This is um, the type of house that people lived in for about 10,000 years before Europeans came to California. And this was made as a collaboration between an ethnographer and um, a native informant. And what they did is they put all these stickers on with these different terms that uh, related in the Pomo language to that house. And so the students put together a learning app to teach them to using the pragmatics of language to actually teach in a Pomo village that you navigate throughout the day. So what you did in your VR, you would fly into the village, you'd have different options for learning about the village, and then you could navigate different times of day and it would tell you what time of day that was. And then finally, you could go into like the ceremonial house, and anything you pointed on 
it would tell you the name of that and you could learn the name of it. So it's a, it's a cool language tool. And these are art history students with no C-sharp background before they came in. So it's amazing, I mean, the, I always tell my students, the first computer scientists didn't call themselves computer scientists. So like, just get in there and build cool stuff and the rest will come to you. And they really get, they have that vertic vertical ethos. Uh, another group of amazing students, this isn't going backwards, uh, that Davian is a part of. Um, I've always been inspired by these types of installation that make books float around in your head. And so we're using Vuforia and Unity to actually retrieve, uh, we're using markers that trigger events in Unity and we're doing <coughs> some online, some uh, augmented reality exhibitions on uh, UC Berkeley's library holdings. So the first show is, the first idea we have is that this mosaic down here in Doe is going to trigger an event where uh, 20 really important banned books that are in the Berkeley Library float up out of the floor and you can tap on them and retrieve them in OSCE cat and maybe if we'll have time we'll have some type of interactive map that will actually tell students how to get there. So few of my students actually. <laughs> so this is a cool way of engaging that and also of curating a space. If you've ever been to the base to Doe, it's this giant monumental Guggenheim S space that there's nothing happening. So AR is a really cool way of, for me, leveraging uh, types of spaces that you can kind of do a Hail Mary around. Kind of uh, to do an exhibition like this would be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, tons of bureaucratic red tape. But to do an app that exhibits this type of data is like five really talented undergraduates at two wishes right now. So thank you so much, and let's give Gene a round of applause for organizing this. It's a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. And thank you all to the amazing panelists. They were great. Um, hi, uh, so I'm Bala. I'm a PhD student uh, working with Professor Beyond. Uh, I specialize in uh, AR VR interactions and, okay. Yeah, that's a lag. <laughs> so, um, so particularly I deal with uh, AR VR interface paradigms for uh, interacting with robots, right? Um, I expect robots to come into our households anytime soon, right? <laughs> we already have uh, robots like drones that some of us use on a regular basis for uh, photography and purposes like that. So these are the current uh, state of robots. As you can see, um, to interact with these robots, we either need to like uh, program them using laptops or with, you, know, you just stick in a tablet display into them and then you uh, work with them. So that is this clear layer of abstraction which uh, I intend to remove using AR VR interfaces. Right, so how might um, such an interaction with a robot look like? For example, yeah. So um, consider um, a robot in a work, a robot in a workspace, and you want to command it to, you know, kind of pick up a block and then place it somewhere over there. Right. Even communicating that information to the robot requires um, very sophisticated uh, artificial intelligence technology, uh, which may or may not exist in the near future. Uh, so the idea is, okay, the, how do we simplify this task using uh, AI VR interfaces? It could be as simple as, you know, just point, point at it. You can see the red circle come over, select it, select that particular object, whichever you want, and then just drag it across to the floor, right? Th th this is a very naive interaction, right? But <coughs> at the first start, even such an interaction could solve a, a problem that's pretty complex to solve using AI. So, uh, so the idea is that uh, whatever I told you, just um, to formalize it a bit further, it's kind of solves the common uh, human-robot interaction problems of, you know, grounding, like having the same information which the robot has, uh, and uh, I mean, trying to communicate the same information that human has to the robot, uh, spatially referring, uh, sp uh, s kind of spatially referring your commands to the robot, right, uh, and. Uh, kind of more a, more of a rich modality of communication. That's what I think AR, VR in general offers across multiple fields. Uh, so the idea is to develop uh, a, a broader framework for uh, exploring this AR, VR paradigm for different forms of robots, right? Uh, just to give a kind of an example, so the first one is kind of a prototype system that was developed for um, commanding drones. Right, so you just place waypoints and then kind of drag them across uh, to uh, to to command to uh, command its path to change its path, right? And I'm also currently studying how these so um, this is a control aspect of it, but how would uh, these visualizations affect how we interact with robots as such, right? Uh, 
uh, trying to communicate robot intent using uh, ARVR. So that's pretty much it. Um, hi there, I'm Jean Ferguson, and I'm a librarian that works at the library. Uh, <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you about a space as opposed to a cool project that I'm working on, although the space is a cool project. Uh, Justin mentioned this, so it was nice to get a little shout out from Justin Underhill about the project that we're working on with him. Um, but we have uh, essentially an experiment going on down in the basement of Moffett Library where we're trying out some new programs and some new services. And one of the most evolved uh, of these programs is the Makerspace that we started a couple years ago. And essentially it has two sides. So one is a very um, standardized operation with students that we hire and are there to support what's happening. And then there's the very chaotic but incredibly innovative student club side. And so there's kind of two sides um, to what's happening inside Thank you. of the Makerspace. So, most of what we do are a lot of um, workshops on 3D printing. We have a student that offers some support for Adobe Office or Adobe uh, Creative Cloud products. We do workshops on 3D printing and our, on Arduino. And we're kind of building up um, our offerings as far as uh, different workshops. I'll just point to you. <laughs> so from the student side, they really push us to try new things. And so this year, um, they're have been very excited about virtual reality and so they do this thing called virtual reality happy hour about once a month where they invite any student in on campus that wants to to come in and just basically try out different types of VR equipment and um, different environments um, in fact tomorrow they're doing a Rick and Morty VR happy hour I'm not sure exactly what that entails but it's kind of interesting uh, and so we, um, kind of based on their enthusiasm, have been reaching out to researchers and to faculty members to figure out how we can also begin supporting VR a little bit more on the operational side of things. And so Justin came to us and said, hey, I have this class and I really need a place for my students to come and to be able, one, to learn about how to use virtual reality and then to begin testing out some environments that they're building. And so we created just basically a small space and an appointment calendar, but it's been incredibly successful. And so we're really looking forward to expanding what we're doing. We'd like to work with more researchers and more scholars. So if you're interested, please let me know. Because uh, much like one of the panelists said this morning, we have, or uh, earlier, uh, we have an unprogrammed space. And we specifically want it to be an unprogrammed space that it's a place where people can just begin to discover what this is and then move on to a more advanced location on campus. That's it, thank you. I've worked in research IT and uh, I've been very fortunate to work with the Hearst Museum of Anthropology and I wanna talk a little bit about our work um, in museums around, con uh, around campus. Next slide please. Which um, are great places for kind of context and um, and storytelling, right? They have these great collections that tell a lot of stories and they range from anthropology museums, art museums, biodiversity collections. So there's so many different kind of avenues in that can be great content for some of the, some of the development of um, VR applications. Um, next slide. So um, one of the great things we've been doing is working with a student team. And we've already heard from some undergraduate students here and you can tell what kind of fresh ideas that they're bringing to this conversation. So we've had really a, a range of projects that are helping us to um, do, you know, develop 3D models based on objects in these museum collections and start building some VR applications and demonstrations of things in um, what you see there on the upper right is a visualization wall in the Hearst Museum of Anthropology and it's called the Hearst Cave. It's actually part of a network of these visualization platforms at four different university uh, UC campuses. You can see here we have students who are doing, working with faculty on actual scholarship so that it's not just about creating neat models of cool things, it's also about actually doing, you know, kind of cutting edge scholarship on um, museum objects. And we're working with people like Gene um, Ferguson and, and our ETS and the library to really figure out how we can help the campus to, um, you know, have the spaces and the, the tools and the services that will help really make this kind of move forward. So thank you. Well, hello, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Wilson Fu and I'm from uh, 
uh, China, and uh, I'm re representing HTC Vive and Vive Video here. So, uh, yeah, as you may, yeah, as you may all know, uh, our Vive is famous for its uh, room scale experience, com coming from the sixth degree of freedom. And uh, we, uh, when we first announced the Vive in 2016, it swept all grand awards worldwide. And uh, this year we have a Vibe Pro, which is the more up upgraded one, uh, debuted on CES 2018, <laughs> and it's won a lot of award there. And today I'm bringing some of the Vibe Focus, which is a new brand, uh, a brand new category of VR, which is a standalone VR that is you can get rid of the all the wares, and uh, it's more comfortable and. Uh, it still have, uh, has, a, has a capability to, to provide a six degree, six degree of freedom experience. And uh, you're welcome to ha have a try in the demo space. And uh, as an as a educational uh, section of Vive, uh, we are dedicated to doing the uh, Vive of VR education. And now we are mainly focusing, uh, based in China, but we have done uh, plenty of things uh, in the past, of few, uh, past one year. And I'm really glad to see so many of you here and uh, sharing with us the, your <coughs> uh, experience in, v in doing VR, using VR to do the education. So here are some things we, we, uh, we are doing. Uh, the first one, we are providing turnkey solutions, including hardware, softwares, and also some systems. So for example, if we have uh, 20 vibes or vibe focus <laughs> in one classroom, uh, we are allowing teachers to to have fully control over the progress of the students. And also they can uh, doing uh, some early generation peer-to-peer -peer interactions in that environment, which means you can see your classmates in a virtual environment. And also we, su we support professors uh, to dev develop their own comprehensive VR coursework, which is uh, mm, depend on the needs of the professor. We are helping them to build uh, 3D modules, seeing objects, and also other interactions uh, based on the needs. And also, we provide tools to make uh, creating a VR content without any IT background. So for example, we, you can, uh, we, we have a tool named uh, VMaker, which you can input, import uh, existing PowerPoints or slides into that software and the link each slide to a VR uh, media. It can be a 3D module or it can be a, a panoramic pictures or a uh, scene object. And then exporting to a Vive uh, application or a focus uh, application. And you can experience some of them in Chinese uh, in the demo, demo, demo space. And also we provide curriculums in China to, uh, to, uh, for undergraduate and graduate courses, uh, uh, majors, so that we are uh, hosting uh, future VR engineers and in China to help to build our uh, VR education system, ecosystem. And last but not the least, we have a, a five million uh, fund, a VC fund to incubate uh, innovation teams coming from the universities and colleges. So um, I'm really glad to be here and uh, I want to talk, talk more uh, after the, the the, uh, this event and uh, maybe in the demo demo uh, demo space you can come and have a uh, have experience of our works in the demonstration uh, demo space and uh, welcome all of you to join our VR education ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause to all the lightning talks?